Hey everyone, welcome to part 24 in this FXS Lowrider restoration series. If you're first joining us, you can click on this link in the top right corner. We'll take you to a listing of all the videos. You can click on the first link or whatever link you left off from and continue from there. In our last video, we prepped and cleaned the head bolts, installed the heads onto the engine, and aligned the wrangle to the intake manifold, at which point each of the heads were progressively torqued to 65 foot-pounds. Top end oil lines were installed. After this came the top engine mounts and the associated challenges with aftermarket. Then each of the push rod sets were individually broken down and cleaned, installed and measured, with the remaining push rods placed in and measured in the same manner. In this video we have several projects going on in the mid rear section. Preparations will need to be done around this back area to accommodate the transmission. I found a problem with this mount over here that I'm going to go into in greater detail. I have the tranny on the floor here ready to go. And it looks like we're going to have some problems with the rear brake line T-fitting. So that's going to have to be replaced. So we've got a lot of work to do. So let's get started. I had noticed this mount was loose and couldn't be tightened. And when I had removed it, taking a look at this mount, the mount appeared fine. The threads appeared fine. There's a metal collet behind here. And as I unscrew this, it just kind of falls out. And we look at it, and half of it's gone, and it's not circular. It's like it was drilled through twice. And if we look at the frame, we see the frame is also drilled through twice. This is terrible. It looks like somebody tried to re-drill this and missed the mark, and now it's oval. And nothing's ever going to tighten in this. I'm going to take this opportunity to remove the starter, move it off to the side. We're going to need as much room as possible to work in here. I'm going to label this and otherwise it needs labeling as I move along. Having gone through and verified all these cables, everything seems okay. I'm just going to flip everything over to the top of the frame and get it out of the way. I'm going to take a quick moment here just to pull off this masking tape. I have to clean the rest of this up later. Put a piece of paper towel down because the ends are jagged. What I'm doing now is loosening the transmission mount. So I can remove the plate. This brake T fitting is going to be flipped around so it's on the lower side of the bracket, alleviating the problem I have with clearance on the transmission. This line will have to be fixed again because I broke it accidentally. All areas in this section, both low and high, will be cleaned and degreased so that areas that do not have paint will be treated and receive new protective paint. We can see these areas are especially affected. That area in the back with that big chip, I'm going to be using the same paint I've been using for this frame. We can see this area has been done now. There are no pieces that don't have paint on them. This area is also done up. The frame is now protected against the elements. The transmission mount has been tested against the frame to make sure it sits flush and doesn't require any shimming. Jose was kind enough to let me borrow his welder, so I'm going to go and fix this problem right now, get this out of the way. So I'm going to sand off all the stuff that's been coated on here to get down to bare metal and see what we're working with. Yeah, this is terrible. This is an embarrassment. So I'm going to put a magnetic tool tray behind here to protect the bike. Then I'm going to put a towel down here during the cleaning phase because I'm going to ream out the hole and then I'm going to spray it with carb cleaner back and forth to ream it out to get down to bare metal. And then I would spray it and ream it out and spray it. So I'll pull the towel, find a suitable ground, put safety glasses onto the camera. I'm trying to build up metal in this hole that has good adhesion to the existing metal and then I'll just knock down whatever is remaining. Brushing it off reveals that everything looks good. So we'll hit it now with the Dremel. And then give it a once over with the sanding block. And it looks good. The hole is filled with metal. Everything's flat. So now we'll proceed. I used the initial markings from previously to find the center. And then I punched it. And then I drilled it. Then I tapped it. And 
Now we'll screw in that original isolation mount for a final test. Perfect repair job, we'll move on to the next task. We have several issues with this T-junction on the rear brake system we're going to have to address. I'm going to start disassembling some components now. The one thing I want to do is flip it upside down away from the transmission. The other issue is the bracket is really loose, about to fall off. I'm going to have to weld around this metal here because obviously you can't weld the brass, but I can weld the metal to secure the brass back onto the bracket. So first I'll pull off the brake switch with a 7 8 wrench. Now I'm working to get sufficient metal under this beveled end of the connector here. See also onto the other side as well. I'll have to clean some of this up, but it's going to hold it steady. We can see both sides now have metal under it and it's secured really tight. It's not going anywhere. We'll get it back onto the other bracket, this time in the opposite direction, securing it with the nut and bolt. I will drop a couple cable ties around it till I'm confident the vibrations won't break it loose. I get some Teflon tape on the threads of this switch, scoring off the first thread or two on the top so it doesn't impede the brake system or get clogged. It's coming along, now we can reintroduce the fitting. I reconnected the rear line and then temporarily the electrical cable just to check how it fits. Finally, I re-terminated the front connection. I'm pumping the brakes and it's leak free. Everything's working fine now. The transmission mounting plate hardware will be cleaned, degreased. These square notches here will point forward as I mount the plate here up under the transmission through the studs. Each of the four studs will receive a washer and one of the nuts. Here's one of the bolts that fits into the square hole. I want to have one cleaned on standby, so I've cleaned it up. And now we're going to gently lower the transmission right over this point on the frame. And there's one stud, the fifth one that's going to lock in closest to me. So I'm going to drop in the shim and immediately get that first bolt in for safety. Installing all the hardware on the bottom, not tight, just enough. So if I accidentally bump to the transmission, I'm not going to knock it off the motorcycle. Then I dropped in the second front bolt. You'll notice that I lowered the shift linkage on the transmission up top to install the transmission for clearance purposes. I wanted to point that out. This bolt is also for the bracket that holds the hardware for the rear brake T fitting. I put in the shim for this last one, but I didn't like the bolt and hardware, so I replaced it all from stuff I bought at Ace. There's a fifth bolt that goes up and into the transmission through the frame. This was loosely fit. Took a quick moment to add the breather hose down here after the transmission went in. Screw that in here with the clamp. Then I have a cable tie that directs it downward onto the frame so it doesn't move around. All this was temporarily connected to rotate the engine. It'll now be removed. Here's the old stator I ripped out about two years ago. Just so I could show you how terrible it was. Look at this accident waiting to happen. Now I could throw it away. Look at that crack. And I picked up a new one from Excel. I'm just going to drop it in in this direction with the plug making its way up into the case. But it's going to have to be worked in such that the plug is flush with the outside of the case. So I'm just moving it back and forth with a screwdriver trying to get it up there. We can see at this point I just had a little bit further to go and I completed that. I'm going to turn it so that those two wires are centered and flat against the case, just like that. Putting a little dab of blue Loctite on the end of the threads of these screws because they're so incredibly small and not so much of the screw makes its way into the case. That will stop vibration from loosening them out. And I'm just going to tighten them down. Then with the bigger screwdriver, I'm just going to give them a little snug. There are then two brackets with screws that need to be added to hold the stator in place. The flathead screws, so I insert them now. And I emphasize flathead because the bracket is then dented 
into the flats of the screws on at least one side to ensure that the screws stay and can turn. I removed the surface rust from the housing. It's a dry clutch so there won't be any oil inside. Coated it with a thin layer of boar butter and put it back on. The chain is disgusting and needs to be cleaned before it goes back on. I'll be using kerosene for this. Aside from soaking, it'll be regularly agitated like this. I'll be doing other projects throughout the day as I come back to this. It'll also be scrubbed on all sides and front and back with a toothbrush to remove all foreign debris. Eventually, the kerosene will become so nasty that I'll have to filter it out into the container again so the kerosene will become usable. And then I'll put it right back into that clean container and do the process all over again until all the debris is gone and the chain is now clean and could go back on the bike. A quick check before the chain goes in. Give the rear wheel a spin and the bearing is definitely good in this wheel. There is nothing to replace here. So I'll feed the chain into the rear sprocket. And then what I'm going to do is just roll the wheel in the forward position to feed the chain through. I'll grab it up front. I'll continue to feed it over and around to the transmission and then back down and that should be it meets the other end I was a bit overzealous with the master link removal a couple of years ago so I cleaned up all the parts and using a master link tool I refit that spline back into the master link I did this at the sprocket to hold everything together just like that preloaded the link with the cleaned o-rings Brought it in from the back, place the o-rings on the front side. There's a slight bevel for the front plate that allows things to get started by hand. So I just sort of push it in a bit, holds into place. Got the compression parts on my chain tool, so I'm going to bring it around that link. Lock it over, make sure everything falls into place as I tighten it down checking and rechecking that link will now be compressed back to its correct position and the tool will be removed now there's enough depth to put the locking clip on clip snaps in in the opposite direction of travel I've cleaned it up I place it on like this I use a flat pair of pliers wrapped around one of the pieces of the link to just snap it in and there we go clips on everything's locked in we look from the side, we see all the distances are correct, even at this master link, and that tells us that the chain work is now completed. In rotating this bearing, I could hear that it's seen better days, and it's getting harder and harder to find one not made in China, but I managed to find one from Japan. Size a gauge for extraction, and a support for the other side. And we'll set up for removal. Yeah, this thing looks rather crispy, ready to go. This seal like a reuse because it's a dry clutch and it looks like it's in good condition, so that's just fine. I dropped the new bearing in the freezer. I've cleaned out and inspected the race. Here we have the seal all cleaned up like new as well. This one and a half will make a fine support for the underside. A 36 mil socket should be absolutely perfect to seat this bearing. Cold bearing fell right through the race to the bottom. Bottomed out, look at that. So I'm gonna let it warm up, but I'll tell you as it warmed up, it didn't bite. So I'm gonna have to peen the race because it's seen better days and maybe the old bearing was rusted on. So this will fix it, take some time. Try and get a good amount of surface area. And here we go. We're gonna put it back in the press and repress that bearing in. I know it'll seat by hand for a starting point. Now we'll just press it into the bottom. Mm -hmm. 
and we're good. This bearing's in, turns nice, much better than the other one. We should get a good number of miles out of this. I'm gonna drop the outer seal right in quick, seat it in with my fingers first. I'm gonna tap it in with a hammer using one of those bits. There we go, seal's in. This portion of the project's done. On the way back, I stopped by Ace and picked up replacement nuts and bolts for the transmission mounts. And what is a somewhat major setback to the project, the lip repair that was done on the side of the engine was never finished by the machinist. Only the ring was installed, and it sits way too proud. It wasn't machined for the original inner primary. So I've had to machine this inner primary in order to accommodate it. I could get by with this because it's a belt drive and it's not a wet clutch, but I was able to knock off a good amount of material after staging all this, removing the hardened metal on the outside, as well as recontouring this inner primary, as you see here, to accept the ring. And the machinist also took too much off when he faced off the side of the engine, so when you try and put the inner primary on, it bottoms out against a transmission that pushes against the mount, and you can't get it to fully seat. This is only a test fit, so the lineup is not beautiful, but everything's tightened down on the engine side right here. The transmission was allowed to float, and what I'm going for is, is the ability to deflect the transmission that it still has room to move. We could see that it's moving. Looking from the other side, it's very important that the inner primary lockdown doesn't impart any stress on the transmission or the frame or vice versa, or something's going to crack. A view from the bottom without the spacers, these studs would bottom out against the mount right here and that would stop the transmission from pushing all the way back, which would stop the primary, which would cause a gap on the engine. The shift linkage was also greased and tightened down before we continue while there's room to do so. Much time was spent cleaning out the work area to ensure that all debris was removed. Everything was coated with an extremely thin layer of grease and the stator was reinstalled. Put just a little bit of grease on these two spacers just to hold them together in position on the side of the engine. Carefully bringing the inner primary cover around. Transmission comes through as I line up the two studs from the transmission, bringing everything into place. And I just want to get everything seated as I quickly secure it with two nuts just so nothing falls accidentally. I'm going to straighten up everything after this. At this point, I'll be setting my torque wrench to about 21 foot-pounds. And I had just started torquing the inner primary, these nuts, on the engine. And I had asked the machinist as well on the bottom end rebuild to proof these. And sure enough, stripped out the threads on this top one. It wasn't checked. So I'm going to have to take this off. This thread's going to need to be repaired. This is done. There's no thread work left here. Look at this. Push it in. Pull it right back out. Case itself is not damaged. We should be able to make a clean repair. It's just worn out threads. I actually didn't have helicoil in 516s, 18s. So I went out and bought one of those starter sets that came with everything. Also needed a drill bit to accommodate this. This is a size Q.322. Everything's been dressed up for work so I don't get metal shavings everywhere in the stator, what have you. And before I forget, I'm just going to blow out any crap that's in there. I've checked this, but I'm going to do it once on camera. Make sure that the bolt actually fits the helicoil. Because I need to be deep enough for the helicoil, but not too deep as to blow through the engine case. It's sort of a dance that's going on here. I need to be deep enough also for the cutting tool. And I want to mark this once it's determined with a piece of tape. Let's grab the depth of the engine first. Well, it looks like we have enough grace, if by a little. The drill better be slow and perpendicular. You only get to do this once. At this point, we're going to blow out the shavings and start cutting the helicoil threads. Apply some lubricant to our thread cutter. Bring this in straight again. Must be perfectly perpendicular. Can't make any mistakes here. I'm using the ratchet extension only because there's not enough room for the T-bar. But every couple of turns, I'm removing it cleaning it out because it's aluminum. I don't want that aluminum going and getting the threads all gunked up. So every couple turns, bringing it out, cleaning it, putting it back in, doing this over and over again. I don't want to risk any problems, so I'm taking my time. 
bringing it in deeper, it gets more stable because you have more threads to work with, but you have to start wondering about bottoming out. So again, every couple of turns, still vigilant, but you're checking to see if you're going to get that sudden resistance. I haven't hit it, but it's getting to the point where I want to start checking my depth. So I'm going to stop and mark it and compare it. So I'm going to put a piece of tape on it and I'm going to bring this thing back out and we're going to look at it as compared to the Gila coil. Looks very close. I'm going to give it one more full turn off camera so I could countersink it and that's it. Put a mild chamfer on the hole with the chamfering bit. Now I'm going to gently screw one of the Gila coils into the insertion tool. There's a positive stop there that holds that little sprig just like that. The heel coil will now go into the hole. There'll be some mild resistance. It's cut that way. Uh, the first several threads I could get turning with my fingers. And that's good because I could align it nice and straight into the hole. I'm going to finish it off with a T-bar once I get it in far enough. Then use a T-bar to bring it in about one turn below the chamfer is where I want to be. And that's going to be the final place for it. That little sprig has a small cut in it that allows it to be broken off when hit with a drift. So I got one of the appropriate size. I'll just put it up against there and give it a couple of light wraps with a hammer. Once it breaks off, I'll just blow it out with some air. Finally, I'll test fit one of the new screws in the hole. I'm not going to reuse the old ones. They're too far gone. They're all going to be replaced fits very nice. Here's a close-up of the repair again with everything completed. I'm just going to be putting everything back together and we're going to continue. Here's the new kit from Colony that arrived that took one bolt out for testing. Mounted everything back up. Torqued it down from the engine side first. We're looking around 22 foot-pounds. Confident everything would be nice and tight with the new thread inserts. And we still have some wiggle room on the transmission. Nothing was binding. There's no stress points going to be using the old nylox till I confirm that the shimming is correct. We're going to torque this side down now. Now check for binding and bring my keyway to 12 o'clock. I kept having to rework the tranny mount to the frame, taking off the inner primary. Two of the spacers had busted off. Every time you move the spacers in position, it would adjust the distance from the transmission to the frame, readjusting all of the configuration. This thing had to go. I was going to have to replace this tranny mount. The problem I demonstrate with the inner primary back off is that the transmission is rocking back and forth. And we could see it from both angles. How I found this in this dramatic reenactment was I had noticed there was gap between the transmission and the mounting plate after I had tightened down the mounting plate and there was different gap on all four sides here except for on the fifth bolt and this mounting plate had flexed after it was torqued down. Yeah, this is no good. I couldn't proceed with this. Over here, it could sit flush on this fifth bolt, but yeah, the plate itself, I had come to find out that they had replaced this plate with a much more stout plate. I had ordered one I'm going to have to rip out the transmission and replace this. I'm not going to do this on camera, but I did want to show the difference between the two plates. This being the more modern ones, essentially two welded pieces of metal together. It doesn't have those little spacers on them. So here it is from the side. So I'm going to swap it out. And this whole front frame section is going to have to come down to bare metal to accommodate this new mount. All the mounts are cleaned up. I do have a little bit of a rock left side rear i figured out ten thousandths of an inch we'll stop that wiggle everything's now balanced all the mounts look a little bit worn so i imagine the transmission is going to need to be shimmed slightly when it goes in but that's fine this time i've pre-torqued the transmission mount without the transmission checked all four sides for gap again it's good but the mounts are worn from vibration in a primary is torqued down flush on the fifth bolt we can see everything is lined up and I have just a couple thousand shims right there to shore up the slight inconsistencies in the frame where it's been worn down. 
on this side too. We're looking at like one thousandths, two thousandths of an inch. Some of this might have more to do with casting. You see me just sticking a piece in in this corner. Couldn't be fit all the way in. Just to remove stress from the transmission is all. And we're using brand new Nylox and washers from Ace. So we'll finish this project by drawing out the slack and tightening down all five bolts to 22 foot pounds. And that's it for part 24 in this series. Got the transmission in, got the inner primary in. A lot more work than I expected, but everything is aligned, everything is shimmed, and it's all looking good. I hope you found this video enjoyable, entertaining, and insightful. When the next episode comes out, I'll post a link up in the top right corner. Do me a favor, click that like button down below. It helps me out a lot when you do. And click that subscribe button to be notified about more videos like this when they come out. Again, I hope you enjoyed this video. Thanks for watching. Thanks for watching. <laughs> Would you like to reply?